Hi, this is Jessica Kalinowski, and this is the final week of updates for using information effectively in philosophy. This week we had to do multiple readings on mimicry in game systems and in cultural life um, that really redefined how you would think of your identity and the classification of illings and mimicry in the fact that sometimes they are inseparable. Um, and one of the sociologists um, this, uh, described in the articles, Irving Goffman, um, said that we play many roles in our everyday lives and that our identity is constantly being redefined by both aspects of a situation and the other people with whom we interact. Now that is very interesting because um, when you think about it, basically he's saying that all of life and all of your um, personal identifications are, in fact, a form of game, a form of mimicry, um, in which it is affected by who you are with and how you interact with them. Um, and that's very interesting because that shows that the, the game system of life is very nonlinear and that the, um, the uh, interrelations between the objects in the game system of your life changes based on the um, the changes in the objects, uh, and that's very interesting. And um, another point brought up is that personal identification in games is different um, and on a much deeper level than um, movies. Uh, because it com combines the spectator with participant by uh, offering the spectator its own body with which to identify with as an object. And that's very interesting because it allows you to dive into the realm of avatars and um, basically personal identif identifications in games. And when you think about it, it's very interesting because in movies, you are able to feel emotion for the character and go along with their story and be captivated by it, but you really aren't a part of it. But with a game, you can feel like it's more like real life than um, a movie. And um, the ability of an avatar to die and then be resurrected um, with like a click of the button um, represent a cycle of symbolic rebirth a staging within the technology of the player's own vicious circle of ego confirmation. Um, it basically completes an arc of desire um, within the human system, and it allows for identification and re-identification with the avatar as your own identity. So it allows you to um, seep into the character and really believe that the mimicry can be real life, um, and that is your real identity. However, with the death of the avatar, um, you are like brought back into reality and the real world, and see that your um, identity has changed. And um, a lot of there was some formal characteristics of the mimicry game system, um, mimicry and of actual video game systems that were defined in one of the articles um, based upon the game Space War from 1962. Um, and it, it established the uh, formal attributes as being um, a player identifies with an on-screen avatar. Um, the player controls the avatar through a physical interface so you can control how um, your avatar moves by pressing the arrow keys or um, moving the toggle on your joystick. Um, and then players engage in play that is set between specific rules and conditions. And that is the same with every game system. Um, so every game system has specific rules that are written down or unwritten within the system. Um, and in it, um, imposition of extra digit um, constructions, constraints um, that make mere rules more rules than the player 
that the player and not the avatar knows. So there may be like a trope or a plot point within the game that the player is told, however the avatar is not told, so you become more godlike with the avatar's identity than before. And the last one is um, frequent, frequent breakdown and reconstruction of avatarial identification through destruction of avatar. So what I was saying before about how um, simultaneously d dying and then being reborn um, also <coughs> excuse me also um, ends and then restarts the identification process with the avatar and my example of complete assimilation, I guess you can say, with the mimic of your avatar and with the mimic of, um, with the identification of what you're trying to mimic, I have, um, the example would be the, a specific breed of, uh, crab spider that preys upon the turtle ant in South Africa and it's very um South America excuse me and it's very interesting because it mimics the turtle ant in every way possible where it looks almost exactly like a turtle ant um the only problem is that spiders have two segments in their body and ants have three so the way they can get around this is that they kill an ant and they bite the neck and hold the head down so it looks like they're carrying, they're just another ant carrying a fallen outside of the colony. So they're actually able to infiltrate the colony and mimic a turtle ant to the highest extreme where they have the same behavior and same physical appearance, but um, more importantly, it ends up having the same chemical um, fingerprints, I guess you can say, that a turtle ant would have, which is way more important than just the physical appearance for turtle ants because they have a rudimentary visual um, system. So they rely more on chemical pheromone um, directions. And so having that extent of mimicry pretty much allows them to become completely um, enveloped in the identity of the turtle ant and then bring it back by um, feeding on the turtle ants and ending that life cycle. So that's all I have for this week and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>